It's Sunday night, 9 o'clock. Welcome to All Across Live. I'm Gary Groob in Toronto, and with me as always, I have Sean Slat over in Moose Jaw. How you doing, Sean? Doing pretty good, thanks, Gary. Excellent. I got Muffler Mike over in Connecticut. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing good. Excellent. God, we have a lot of stuff to discuss this week, guys. Man, there was news yeah. all over the place, and big news. Never mind this little tiny stuff like games and things. Huge, huge news. <laughs> Stick with us, and we will be on... All of that in but a minute. Just a, a few things to get out of the way first. Just to remember that all the shows are streamed uh, live across Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and also Twitch. And you can get all, all, catch all the action on eopsports.com. Remember to hit the subscribe, follow, and like buttons and always share. As you see, we have many shows. Uh, please enjoy all of our affiliates. And I love Steel Steps, especially with that uh, big pay-per-view from Perth the other day. So lots of uh, things for them to discuss. And we will have one of them on. Pat will be on with Wings Nest later on. If you've missed a show, no worries. You can grab all the podcasts and all the major podcasting companies, which include Amazon, iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, and so much more. You can also catch all the shows on the EOP YouTube page. Or if you're looking for our show in particular or other things from us, you can go to All Across All the Time on YouTube, where we've just added another couple of retro games. Uh, from the early 2000s, uh, I believe one was from 2000, one was from 2003. Got a 1999 game coming up and a few mill games in a, in a couple of weeks as well. So there's about 20 or 25 of them up there, plus press conferences, uh, interviews, fights, everything you can think of. So please head over to our YouTube page and give it a uh, subscribe, please. Remember, you can stay up to date with all sports by visiting eopsports.com with great articles from our huge staff and contributors. While you're there, please subscribe to our newsletter. Well, oh, World Traveler Eduardo is with us, I believe. Yeah, he's, right he's, he's, he's been uh, traveling all day, so uh, he's uh, kicking back in some of that cool climate of uh, Puerto Rico, or <laughs> probably with a margarita in hand. <laughs> great to have you with us, Eduardo, our Western... Our Western correspondent, who should be our Southern correspondent now. <laughs> and God knows if we ever put a team over in Columbia, you'll be our guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, let's get the uh, the first thing, uh, the biggest thing over with first. And that is, during the week this week, <clears throat> the NLL and the New York Riptide made huge news that the New York Riptide will relocate to Ottawa next season. They will become the Black Bears and will be out of the Canadian Tire Centre where the Ottawa Senators play hockey. The ownership group that is now uh, their ownership group will continue to be their ownership group and partner with the Ottawa Senators who will handle marketing and ticketing and things like that and help them along to get them off to a fresh and good start uh, while they're there. Now, Mike, you had a talk with Rich Lisk about this, did you? Yeah, yeah. Asked, asked him a few brief questions, you know, uh, uh, one of the things that that he did uh, he did mention was uh, the timing of the announcement and the reason that it was done now instead of waiting until sort of the end of the season was just to basically allow them to more time to to build up start to build up fan base get ticket sales um, you know they're in a strategic business partnership with with the Ottawa Senators of the NHL, um, you know, they'll be handling the marketing, the promotion, the ticket sales. So, you know, from, from that standpoint, it, it, it makes sense, you know, to, to get an early jump and, and try to just start building the fan base, you know, now, instead of say three months from now. Yeah. And it's not like they really, really wanted to, they're kind of forced to, the Nassau County Coliseum is being torn down. A casino is being put up in its spots. So they really had no home. So they needed to do something. And this is a very viable option. And uh, it wasn't working, obviously, over in Long on Long Island. Because uh, although uh, attendance was getting better, it still, by any stretch of the imagination, was not good. And it will lead us into our, our Panther City chat later on about come as your favorite empty seat. Yeah. And I, and I, expect, yeah. I expected them to be the first one to be moving. And I'm still not with that off the table. I still expect that um, Laval or something like that uh, might be uh, an announcement 
uh, maybe at the end of the season, because we wouldn't want to stop the 200 people from going to Panther City and say, no, we're not going to go now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's why I kind of said earlier that this one wasn't quite on my bingo card. I yeah. always thought, like you, Gary, I thought Panther City would be the first one to move. But, uh, uh, yeah, um, about the announcement timing, I mean, it sucks for New York fans uh, having to kind of go through this now knowing that their team's not coming back next year. But uh, Do you see signs of Edmonton along. in this one? Though? You know, like no. Edmonton, they, they suffered through a bad team in Edmonton for years. And they finally win a championship, and they move to Saskatchewan the next year, where they win yeah. again. So they're the only team I know that have won championships back to back in two different cities. But you know, it's that same kind of idea. The team finally gets good, and off it goes. Yeah. For the Quebec Nordiques and the Colorado Avalanche in hockey, point. where they spent all that time building with weak teams, and they finally had that team. And the first year they moved to Colorado, they won the Stanley Cup. So, yeah. You know, it's it's that kind of thinking that's uh, I don't know. But uh, it was it was a forced move. It wasn't that. Uh, nope, we just don't like you fans, and off we go. So. No, but it's a better scenario for them. And like, obviously, there's definitely a market there in Ottawa. Um, the fans are definitely going to come. But uh, yeah, yes, and San Juan, Puerto Rico yeah. is where Eduardo was coming to us. And uh, thank you very much, Eduardo. I'm looking good to lose. No, just for anybody who didn't know, I had put up a, an announcement. I, I had actually uh, with uh, a little bit of workout changes and. A little bit eating different. I, I dropped 45 pounds in the last five months, so I feel great and gotten back and even into running again. So it's like, hey, <laughs> I have an old classmate of mine. Actually, it's a little sidetracked, funny story. He's going to meet up with me uh, in Prague when we do the Rubeski tournament. And um, well, uh, he wants to go jogging when we're out there. Yeah, that's why I'm going to Prague. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <I don't laughs> <jog from Prague. laughs> right. <laughs> do you spill the drinks when you? <laughs> <laughs> Brian Cole is with us from Philadelphia. Hey, how you doing, Brian? Brian? I, I actually know how you're doing, Brian. There's a, Brian's hurting a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Greg, great to have you with us, though. And uh, yeah, thank but, you but get, get, getting back to uh, getting back to the, this move, um, I don't mm -hmm. view it the same as Saskatchewan. You know, this was a matter of they didn't have a place to play. Right. You know, right. whether it was well, after this year or after next year. You know, I don't my, think my, that, my, I don't my, think that I understand. Well, in some ways. Well, I was going to say, I mean, my, my understanding was, you know, that they had the, the lease at least through next year, I believe. Either this year or next year. So, you know, if, if there's, you know, if, the, you know, if they already knew there was a plan in place to, to, you know, to demolish the arena or something like that. Um, you know, I, I'm sure, I'm sure they tried other options. I was going to say, though, Edmonton, um, they didn't have a place to play either. It wasn't so much as a demolition of a place as much as Edmonton didn't want them in, the Oilers didn't want them in their arena, and they were renovating it to be a smaller arena uh, where they're currently playing. So um, in some ways, it is a little bit of a similar situation. They didn't have anything played. Also a little bit like uh, the um, Georgia move also out of Minnesota. Everybody talks about, well, they had a great fan. Well, they didn't get along with the uh, the people who were running the building. And yeah. that's huge. And really, we had, I'm going to have John Arlotta on the other show on uh, March the uh, March the 8th or March the 7th, whatever the first Thursday in March is. That'll be an interesting little thing. We're going to bring that up and, and talk about uh, all the things went down in Minnesota and going to Georgia. So uh, that's, more of, that's more of what I see here, other than the building wasn't demolished. Yeah, that's why I keep saying. The like, final thing is there's going to be no building. It's going to be a casino. Yeah. That's why I say, keep saying, like, I don't think it's going to work in Edmonton unless you have the Oilers on board. If they're not on board, it's not going to work. And they've always been kind of wishy-washy whether they actually want a team or not. So, mm -hmm. yeah, they, they got, it, was, it was mutual, really. Yeah. It was mutual, and Urban saw an opportunity, and, uh, well, he obviously made the right choice because uh, the last number of years – you know, granted, it's uh, with different ownership now, and it's a little bit waning because the team is hasn't been as uh, spectacular as it was when it first came in there. But uh, you know, the last six years, seven years have been really, oh yeah, very very spectacular years in there, as well as all the ground ground roots programs, all the youth programs that came from scratch. And oh, I, I remember going in there. Uh, I believe it was uh, around a March break for uh, one game or one set of games, and watching the programs going on. Uh, at uh, a couple of the uh, the rink, it was amazing 
how many different lacrosse programs were going. And that's a couple of years ago. So it's only increased since then. Yeah, no, it exploded since then. Yeah. Yeah. Just one other thing I, you know, I want to bring up was, you know, I, I, when I spoke to him, I, I did ask him, you know, he, he basically told me that the current ownership will remain 100% owning the team. So this isn't, this isn't a matter of, Hey, they're selling the team to the Senator's ownership group. Right. So, yeah. Which stops uh, all the yeah. questions. Of, yeah. Is going to yeah. the well, yes, yeah. for, for, if, and, and for me, for me, you know, cause, cause you know, I mean, I, I went ahead and asked him point blank. I said, you know, is, is there a change in, you know, the NLL's business model regarding expansion and relocation, you know, as it relates to what we knew it was when Nick Sakevich was the commissioner. Mm -hmm. And that was basically, you know, that they were going to search for ownership groups, you know, that would allow for favorable arena deals, whether it was, you know, with NHL or, and, or NBA ownership, you know, or just, you know, Joe Sy. just Yeah. Or yeah. yeah. Somebody so, with 17 um, million in their pocket. <laughs> I was going to say that's probably the only maybe small downfall I see in this deal is if this partnership with Sens ever goes sour, that's it because they're not the owners. They could be out in the streets again. Yeah, well, that's why they have leases, right? And they've got a five-year yeah. lease on this one. So if, if they are, are hunky-dory after five, I'm sure it's going to be extended. Toronto's only working with a five-year lease in Hamilton, and they, they're going around magically, even with the renovations that are coming yeah. up. So I'm, uh, I'm assuming they're going to be added on to it, but uh, uh, it worked out very, very nicely. You know, just the last thing I was going to add is, you know, a lot of people forget to the one point of the Nick Sakavich business model was that they were going to have owners who were going to commit to a solid five years. So mm -hmm. it wasn't going to be, yeah. hey, I'm starting an expansion team. Two years later, I'm folding because... List your, myriad, list your myriad of reasons, you know, to yeah. follow. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, and, and I only bring that up because uh, I think, I think it's important for folks to know that, that that hasn't changed with Brett Fruit coming in now. Right. And running the league. In and, fact, it's probably more and, solidified now. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, I think everyone needs to take a step back and realize, yes, this applies to Panther City too. And this applies to you know other expansion teams. Well, you know, I think we, Albany. We, is we know. We know. We, you know. Obviously, we know San Diego's not going anywhere. Rochester's not going anywhere. That you know that that that's pretty obvious. You know, mm -hmm. Las Vegas yeah. most likely isn't going to go anywhere. You Georgia's know, not they, going they, anywhere. They, they they need you know. No. But but you know they also need a little more time to to build up the same as Panther City. Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, of course that. Then the questions go to, you know, well, what can Panther City do or, you know, that they aren't maybe already doing, you know, to to build up the attendance. But uh, but I, I, I think I, I think that point needs to get out because I don't think there's enough people in the community who realize that. With every expansion that's been happening in this recent wave, you know, with whatever, however many teams it was. That every team, you know, the ownership group is committed to a five years mm -hmm. of, Hey, we're, yeah. we're investing in this team for five years. Right. And bringing up Georgia was a great example. I mean, look at their first few years where we were even talking about, is this sustainable? Look at the empty seats. It just, mm -hmm. it just took them some time to market it out. And now we yeah, have, yeah, I mean, they're not going anywhere now. They're in the yeah, 68,000 no, range now every yeah. night. Yeah. They're a viable product now. So, so I'm hoping that that happens with Panther City, but I just, you know, I just don't, I don't see it. And we've had people there and come back to us that, uh, you know, summer MSL games in some places get more than they're getting in a NLL game. And it just, it's hard to shoot it. If you're looking at tonight's game, it's very difficult to shoot it because you don't want to see all these empty seats, especially white empty seats. It yeah. just stands out and, you know, sporadic people here and there. You know, if anything, I would do it as the PLL did it in their first years and put everybody on the one side uh, facing the cameras. So, yes, maybe they're taking pictures of empty seats, but uh, at least on camera, it looks like there's some form of people in that lower bowl. But, uh, you know, that's uh, that's for later on. Let's move on from there, guys.
That's uh, that's huge news, and uh, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more things about that. And with their press conference, of course, as we mentioned, they're going to be called the Ottawa Black Bears. So anybody hope that, oh, we'll have a Rebel again? No, no. Separate entity, separate everything. Uh, And what was the difference? Ownership groups, guys. Ownership groups. Back then, like it was guys who, hey, I want to own a team. And a couple of years later, it wasn't so much fun anymore. And, you know, wanted to discard it or they weren't making what they thought they were going to make. Here, when you have legitimate ownerships like NHL ownerships or guys like Joe Sy or Jamie Dawick, you guys are committed into what they're doing and they're going to be here for the long haul and have committed to that. And like I said, Brett Fruit is actually more towards this of stabilization than even Sikavitz was, where Brett doesn't want to do any expansion until everybody is stabilized. So, and I, I keep bringing back to Albany, and I know the league wants to stay away from that because this is their third move, right? Philly to New England, New England to Albany. So I'm sure that they want to put a little bit more resource in there. And having Oliver Marty there, who is a former mill player and also a uh, very, very wealthy man, and his hedge funds are, are doing fantastic. So, you know, a tax break now for later on a profit. I don't think he's uh, too concerned about that. Andy's I was actually going to, I was going to quickly mention about that name. I'm wondering if the Rush still own the name for the Rebels, but because that is technically mm-hmm. their franchise, maybe that's why they couldn't go with the Rebel name. But right, all right, let's uh, let's move on from there. Um, World Lacrosse, the box championships, they uh, they came out with a uh, with their pools, and uh, as you can see in Pool A, Canada, Haudenosaunee, United States, England, that is the big one. Pool B. Israel, and, uh, you know, I'm really impressed with uh, with that team, um, field and box. Hong Kong, Mexico, Belgium, Pool C, Finland, Switzerland, Japan, Greece. Japan's going to be one that's going to yeah. turn a lot of heads. Their field team was incredibly improved, and I'm assuming that the same thing is going to be with their box team. They are fast, and they are homegrown, unlike a lot of the countries which had a grandparent that maybe could spell Japan. Um, they actually homegrown their ta- their talent. So, <clears throat> and Greece, Czech Republic, um, the Raditz team that I get to watch uh, when I go over to uh, to um, Prague is pretty amazing. And I'm sure a lot of those guys are going to be on these teams: Scotland, Jamaica, and Chinese Taipei. Um, the next set of groups: Pool E, Netherlands, Austria, Italy, U.S. Virgin Islands. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pool F is Australia, Slovakia, Puerto Rico, Hungary. There you go, Puerto Rico. Eduardo, we got a uh, uh, job for you to cover. Yeah. <laughs> While you're there, if you could get us. Uh, some... I was going to say, stop <laughs> sleep on Australia because they've got a growing box program going there. They do. So. They do. And so does Germany, for that matter. Pool yeah. G, Germany, Ireland. And I know that the um, it, it's funny because um, the uh, the Gales going to the Robeski have actually partnered with Ireland to try and form a super team to try and make another run for the uh, Rubeski, uh trophy. So let's see what uh, what comes about with that group, uh, Poland and China. They also announced the women's group. And uh, they have the United States, England, Haudenosaunee, Hong Kong, and Netherlands in Pool A, Canada, Australia, Ireland, Germany, Finland, Pool B, much more um, leveled playing field there. So... Um, that's going to be a really good uh, little tournament. I'd say a full tournament, but, uh, you know. And Matt's with us. Matt, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. I just watched play at the, uh, at the uh, Indigenous Heritage Night over in uh, in Hamilton last night, and he was part of the uh, the halftime game, uh, which was an interesting interesting game, watching uh, Odinashoni and uh, Antikwabi, huh? Yeah. So, and watching the different sticks, including one that looked like this. And some of the stick handling was just absolutely incredible. So, moving along. Um, OJLL news. This one uh, got me scratching my head a little bit. The OJLL is going to have a game, a showcase game, in the Canada Day long weekend, June 29th in the Nepean uh, arena. Uh, yes, you all know Nepean as the team that was trying to get into the uh, OJLL. And because of Peterborough and Kitchener uh, were blackballed twice 
in the votes and couldn't get a junior A team, but they're good enough here to uh, have a showcase. Now, my thinking is, you know, to put a little bit of sense into this, is that if they put this game there and if they draw well, it will be a good argument that they are able to handle a junior A event. And maybe it stands a better chance of them getting that junior A team. Otherwise, it's just a kick in the shins, right? You know, you can't have one, but here, watch it up close. It's the old joke. They got in yeah. Ottawa. Well, maybe they should have put the Ottawa, Nippin, not, Ottawa and Nippin got an NLL team for a junior A team. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> 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 yeah, we didn't think about it that way. Just to, just to rub a little more salt. Here's an interesting one for you guys. Um, let me just get this as graphic up. Uh, Hamilton, the Bengals, Senior B. Now, uh, the statement, and let me read this uh, to uh, for you. Uh, the Hamilton Lacrosse Association is thrilled to announce that we have acquired the rights to the Senior B lacrosse team from the Oakville Rock. This marks a pivotal moment in our association's history and presents exciting opportunities for growth and success. <clears throat> As part of this acquisition, the team will be rebranded as the Hamilton Senior B Bengals, representing our city with pride and determination on and off the lacrosse floor. The team will be an integral part of our community, fostering a spirit of competitiveness and sportsmanship while competing in the Ontario Series Lacrosse League. The addition of the Hamilton Senior B Bengals to our roster of teams not only solidifies our commitment to the development and promotion of lacrosse in our region, but also reinforces our dedication to nurturing talent within our own ranks. We are confident that this new venture will inspire our player, coaches, and fans alike, continuing to ignite a passion for the sport that will endure for generations to come. <clears throat> Furthermore, uh, with the remarkable growth and success of our Junior B program over the last five years, the introduction of the Hamilton Senior B Bengals presents an exceptional opportunity for graduating players within the association. It provides them with a clear pathway to continue their development at a higher level of competition while also contributing to the success, success of the team. We are excited to witness the transition of these talented individuals as they step up to the challenge and make their mark on the Senior B stage. We extend our sincere gratitude to the Oakville Rock organization for their cooperation throughout this process, and we look forward to our continued partnership as an affiliate to the Oakville Rock of Major Series Lacrosse. With the 2024 season fast approaching, we encourage all members and supporters to join us in welcoming the Hamilton Senior B Bengals to our lacrosse family. Together, let us rally behind our new team as they embark on this exciting journey. Exceptional, eh, guys? Yeah. So a new uh, new home. I guess the Oakville Rock, uh, uh, they just want to concentrate on uh, MSL and uh, trying to win a man cup. So anyways, a little bit of PLL news before we move into uh, ALL. And that was um, a uh, kind of a copycat thing. Like last year we had Lyle Thompson saying, uh, no, I'm going to stick around home. This year we have Dane Smith been placed on the holdout list. So it looks like he's not going to be playing. Uh, he is also part of the Six Nations family. So let's see if uh, he crops up there as they try and repeat as Man Cup champions this summer. Why not showcase the Arrows and Northmen? Uh, I agree. I imagine the deal was already uh, put in with Orangeville before they did any signings of that. It might even have been uh, one of their two teams' uh, home games, and that might have been the game that uh, they were playing each other. Really, the only, the only way I see it. Um, it is what it is. But um, it'll be interesting to see uh, the uh, the reception it gets over in Nepean uh, when that game goes off. A couple of things to put down on your calendars. Uh, the BATS, uh, annual uh, BATS Invitational. Uh, it's their third annual over at the Blue Cross Arena. will be April the 6th. Uh, Face-off is at 1 p.m. If you uh, go to that game, if you, uh, it's free if you have a ticket to the Nighthawk Riptide game uh, for that evening. Uh, game is sponsored by Signature Lacrosse. Uh, City of Rochester Bats Instagram page for ticket information for everything. I'm sure there are special deals for the tickets. The other thing to mark on your calendar is summer's coming, guys. Third annual McDougal Memorial. Uh, remember, you have a Junior A game at three, the Celebrity game, which is always fun at six, the Silent Auction, which was awesome last year. I came away with a couple of really great things. And, of course, a beer garden and live music, which is always fun. 
we know it's summertime. July 6th, 2024, over at the Rock Athletics Center. Mark that on your calendars, folks. Uh, the AL East uh, women had um, uh, five games that went off. I am still waiting to uh, you know, see the scores from those things. But uh, uh, next week, there will be another set of uh, set of games at the Iroquois Lacrosse Arena Saturday afternoon. So don't miss it. Uh, looking at the uh, ALL, they had a busy week this week. Uh, four games went off. They started with uh, the Brampton Express facing the Peterborough Timbermen over in Peterborough. The Express came away with a 13-11 victory, and that came about with a uh, five- or six-goal run that was through the third quarter and ran into the beginning of the fourth quarter, which changed the complexion of the game, and that was your big thing. My uh, screen isn't working with me here. <laughs> oh, wait. No. <laughs> Seemed like such a great idea at the time. Anyways, in our second game on Saturday night was over at the Rock Athletic Center. The Toronto Monarchs played the uh, Whitby Steelhawks. The Steelhawks got out to a 5-1 lead and coasted that into a, uh, an 11-8 victory. However, um, of note is the Monarchs put up a heck of a fight and almost took down the, uh, the league leaders with a, with a heck of a performance. Uh, both goalies, uh, Lucas Coote and uh, Craig Gwendy, were spectacular in that. Uh, Craig Wendy is amazing. He can play it all. Uh, yesterday, I believe, was his uh, his uh, daughter Avery's would have been her first birthday. So to have that on your mind and still come out with this. Uh, now he's mentioned before that every time he steps on the floor, he's playing for her, and he's got the uh, the Avery Wendy sticker on his helmet, and you know. So you can only wish the best for for him. This guy really deserves another opportunity in LL, and uh, I'm really hoping that some team. Uh, out there takes a look and goes, hey, yeah. Because uh, um, hard work and diligence, uh, he's put that all in. And he'll play in any game in any league uh, to get the extra reps. And did that before he got the NLL and is still doing that now. Uh, if we move into this afternoon's games over at the Iroquois Lacrosse Arena, the River Wolves uh, continue their winning ways, but they just slid by the Oswegan Bears 15 to 13. Um, you know, they're snake bit, man. Just snake bit. I think that's eight in a row now that they've lost after a really great start. Um, the uh, first star of the game was Luke Robinson for Paris with five goals, three assists. Lane Smith for Oswegan with five goals and one assist. And Chase Martin in the nets for Oswegan uh, was the third star, just to show you how much rubber he faced. Uh, in the last game of the day and of the weekend, the Oshawa Outlaws uh, faced the Six Nation Snipers, and Oshawa continued with their winning ways. They doubled the Snipers 14-7 to in a, uh, a game in which uh, uh, Jake Lazor, he was the, uh, the first star of the game with seven goals. Chris Atwood, three goals, six assists for Oshawa, was the second star. Dustin Hill, uh, he was the uh, the goalie for Six Nations. He was the third star. He faced an awful lot of rubber as well. So that is the Arena Lacrosse League as we know it this week. Uh, if we look at the uh, the power rankings, for the first time all year, they haven't changed this week. Whitby is still number one. Oshawa is number two. Paris is sitting in third. Brampton in fourth, Peterborough in fifth, Toronto edging up, and uh, they're neck and neck with Peterborough, but they're sitting in sixth. Six Nations is still sitting in seventh, and Oswegan is sitting in eighth. If we look at their standings, um, Whitby is in front with a 10-1 and record. Oshawa is sitting in second with an 8-3 and record. Paris is right behind them with a 7-3 record. Uh, they have the makeup game coming up Thursday this week against the Brampton Express. In fact, they play home and home Thursday and Friday. That'll be interesting. That Friday night game should be explosive. If I wasn't in San Diego, I would catch it. If you're in the Brampton area, you're going to want to get over the Memorial Arena. Um, the Monarchs are sitting in sixth with a 4-7 and seven record. Six Nation Snipers over with a 2-9 and nine record, as well as Oswegan with a two and nine record uh, in the couple of games this week that were from the West coast. Uh, the Eagles beat the Blackfish on Tuesday 
18 to 13. And on Wednesday, the Sea Spray lost to the Grizzlies, 14 to 11. And looking at their standings, uh, the Shooting Eagles are uh, now eight and five. The Sea Spray are eight and five as well, tied with them. Things are tightening up. The Blackfish at six and seven. And the Grizzlies now have won two in a row, and they are four and nine. So nobody is running away from anybody. And, you know, everybody's playing everybody in the playoffs any given day. Correct, guys? Right. Oh, yeah. All righty. Let's keep moving along here, guys. And, you know, it is that time. We have our, <laughs> our steel steps, gentlemen, floating around here. And it is the wings nest time. And, uh, Pat, got to warn you. I got to warn you. In the press conferences, sir, when we have, uh, well, I have Calgary's guys. Uh, in the press conferences, and uh, they're glowing because that's what we're talking about. Zach Higgins. Why? <laughs> you were getting that Higgins too, weren't you? No, no, no. My channel changer must have been on something else. I, I don't know. It, it was, it was terrible. It was all terrible. It was all bad. It was all bad. Uh, well, first of all, hello, gentlemen. Hello, Sean. Hello, Gary. Hello, Mike. But uh. Well, let's let's get let's get into this uh, pile of mess that I watched on 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 uh, on yesterday. Yeah, it, it, look, I I don't know how much I can stress this out. This offense as like an A plus, the defense is like an F, and then you got a uh, goaltender is constantly hung out to dry, and he's playing like a C level right now. So altogether, you got well poop. And that's what they're playing like. It, it's just, it, 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 it's just, it just coming kind of horribly, horribly right now. It, it's, it's got to be like the one of the worst things I've seen right now. It's, it's just, it, it you know, you're trying to comp compete with Calgary. Calgary again, just hat trick. You know, three straight goals. Boom, 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 boom. Your 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 player of the game in that first quarter was Taylor Pace. Just, you know, two one goal, two assists. Uh, the second period, I'll give it to the Wings. That was your best offensive piece uh, game right there. Again, uh, great, good ball movement. You're spreading the ball around, getting your picking your shots. Great, Ben McIntosh making you know some money shots. He looked great throughout the course of this game. But it's just you know, it, when Higgins lets one goes by, there's like three to follow up, and it, it's and it's just unfair. It's just I, I thought this Wings team would be better where they are with you know. Cornell and paper, what we saw at the beginning of the year, what we predicted, it's just totally uh, not going according to plan. And and guys like Dane Taylor was just lighting them up. Uh, Jesse King, who's got, you know, he's slightly had better numbers than Mitch Jones as far as the assists. Uh, he's sitting at 65. Mitch Jones is sitting at 58. But, it, it, you know, this team is just, it's just really, really stressful to watch. I mean, Paul Day asked for this. He said he wants to get more playing games. Well, he's getting it. I think right now he's Bit off more than you can chew right now. Uh, the only good, great thing about the uh, Philadelphia Wings, you get to face Calgary at home, which I technically don't. Now I'm thinking about it. This could be signs for bad things because the Wings haven't won at home. That's true. Yeah, that's yeah. very true. Oh my. So yeah, that that was just a mouthful. I mean, this is I don't know where to go with this team. I mean, again, you uh, your offense is really really solid. But your defense and goaltending is just a combination of of unsuccess, and they, they got to learn to put together. And Mitch, uh, from Paul Day, the, the coaching staff to the you know, it's all got to combine. You know, they got to get on the same page. I see there's times where guys are just you know just picking their pos you know picking their spots on this you know wings defense. Guys like uh, Isaiah Allen, guys like him are getting blown off the coverages, not keeping up. I'm like, come on, what's going on? Well, you got a bright spot. You got the Katoni brothers working together now, right? They were they went together for three separate goals in the game, and beauties at that, looking a little bit like Peterborough. Yeah, yeah, and that's the one thing I'll give. Uh, Holm Katoni looked really, really sharp in this game. Again, the the one back pass that Mitch Jones just makes without even looking uh, is just just really, really sick. I mean, he just makes a back pass. Uh, Holm Katoni right in front of the. Uh, the opposition goaltending, and he just finds the back end of that. It was really, really sharp. Again, like you said, the Catalan brothers kind of getting on the scoreboard, which made things a little better for you. But uh, it, it, I feel like this, you know, this Wings offense, because when you look at them as far as goalie, uh, goal and scoring wise, they're not in the top ten. There's nobody on the top ten, and I feel like this team mentally is stressed out. 
I feel like they just are just so you're just so stressed out of trying to because uh, the defense is just wearing them out and wearing them out. And then in your back of your mind's like, I got to put up at least 20, you know, 16, 17 goals to try and win games here. And you're not going to get that all the time. Right. You're making a good point when you say Higgins is left out to dry. And it also leaves your offense out to dry, right? Because if you're now having to come back from three, four goals down, you're gripping the sticks a little bit more tighter. You're um, maybe forcing shots that you shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and again, it's just it's it's got to be wearing it out. And at some point, you know, uh, again, the, the coaching staff has to come together and try and figure things out. I mean, uh, I mean, they're you know when they like, I know Paul Day doesn't like have his off days, but when they do, they they have a game plan. They actually come up with some uh, some decent plays, and then it's like then it's like you want to get these consistent plays. It's just like you know, what are we doing out there? Uh, it's um, again, you have to try and outscore the you know every your your opposition every time. But now that you know Calgary has a little taste of you now, and he's going to take you in South Philly, um, and, and the home you know home field aspect doesn't really play a role in this game, or won't. All right, let's listen to some of the Calgary Roughnecks. We've got Dan Taylor and Justin Ignacio in the press conferences. I guess I called you hometown heroes. It's nice to you know do this in front of the hometown fans here. Oh yeah, it's uh, I think it's the best thing in the world playing in this arena. Growing up in the city, I remember watching the games from uh, from where I used to sit and being able to play in front of them and have a good game like that is uh, is special. Yeah, you see fellow Calgarian Holden Katoni just got his hat trick. Did that push you a little bit? Well, you know I've played with Holden since I was four years old. Played against them, and uh, you know anytime we're on the floor together, I know we're both going to bring our best. So it was fun. Yeah, and you. you, you you really uh, drove hard to the net for a couple of those goals. Any war wounds right now, or are you doing? You know, midway through the season, there's always war wounds, but that's what ice is for, and you know that's what recovery is for. And we'll be ready to go next week because I have a feeling they're going to come out hot. Well, Dan, a nice imp- uh, performance by you tonight, but talk about the team effort in this one. It's a whole team effort. Like you look at that last last couple minutes there, you got Zach Courier throwing his body around, coming up with probably the biggest loose ball of the game. You know, you got Tyler Pace getting a huge turnover when we need it, and another loose ball back. Like those, those small plays are what adds up over the 60 minutes, and that's what we pride ourselves on, and that's what we're going to continue doing. The way Higgins was playing early, especially, uh, it seemed like it was going to be very difficult to beat him all night. What's the, the conversations on the bench uh, when you've got a goalie that's as hot as he is on the other side? You know, I think that starts uh, that starts at our practice and our shoot around with our coaching staff bringing a great scout to us and telling us where to put the ball. Um, but, you know, Higgins a He's a top five goalie in the league, and, and we got to him, fortunately, but it was with a lot of a lot of effort and a lot of good preparation. And 13 offensive goals, just the one in transition was the empty netter tonight. Just how nice is it as an offense to be able to contribute all those goals when the transition game helps you guys out quite a bit? Well, we know Shane's going to get his, so he got his empty netter. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's big. You know, when, when the O can pick the D up, uh, it's huge because, you know, they do it first nine times out of ten. And so when we can help them out, if they're uh, they're having a battle back there, like that's a very talented team over there. And, uh, you know, if we can pick them up, that's what we're going to do. And it was, a, it was a fun day to be on our offense. Wow. Front of the camera. Well, I mean, we were just talking about you had a great game last game as well against Jake Withers. I mean, that's a tough battle. And then tonight, another good one. How are you feeling about your game right now? I feel great. I mean, getting my feet underneath me, which is great, but I'm leaning on the older guys, our veterans. They've been doing a great job of, you know, supporting me, encouraging me. Um, and yeah, just we're building chemistry right now in the unit, and it feels good. Where do you think that improvement has come from in maybe the last couple of weeks? I think just getting on the same page um, with our wing guys, with with coaches, and um, yeah, we're just you know spending so much time together now. It, it's all working out. This game and last game, there's a few quarters. You got an early goal, like for you, you know, getting that win and getting seeing the guys get an early goal. What's that like for you? Yeah, it's it's, it's adds fuel to the fire for sure. That gets the guys going, momentum, um, and it gives me momentum as well. You know, they capitalize on on my wins. It, it gets me in a rhythm as well, so all working together. What's it like when competing against like TD Erland, Jake Withers? Um, does it give you confidence knowing you can hang with those guys? Yeah, it does. I mean, me and Jake are really close, played on Team Canada together. Um, and uh, so going against him was really, really cool. I think that's the first time we've we faced off against each other in a real game. So, you know, going against the big guys like him, TD, um, 
gives me confidence that I can compete against you know, anyone in the league. And uh, you know, the way guys competing, grabbing those loose balls, helps a lot as well. I know Jeff Sand. I mean, Jeff Snyder's from here. You know, you, you talk to him at all? Or? Bobby Snyder comes Bobby out too? actually. Yeah. yeah you get Bob, some tips yep. Too? Yep. Um, Jeff was actually our U19 coach for Team Canada, so it's pretty cool. Got to work with with Jeff and Bobby now, uh, but Bobby's coming out consistently, which helps. Maybe just on the other side of things, you guys are taking on Philly again next weekend. Anything you are looking to maybe work on heading into that one? I think a full 60 minutes for me. You know, there was the third quarter went slow. I had a few losses in a row, and they built momentum on that. So playing a full 60, um, I definitely owe, owe that to the guys. Faceoff game's always rough, but it seemed like tonight was particularly uh, contentious uh, between you and your counterpart. Um, are you looking forward to renewing that next week? Yeah, I faced Nick um, throughout college. He went to uh, team up north. I went to Ohio State, so I saw him a lot in college. Um, it's cool to play him in, in the pro league now. And yeah, it's always uh, an intense, aggressive game against us. So I'm excited. And that is that. And uh, yeah, I think they face each other again. So um, this will be a heck of a game over at Wells Fargo. Yeah, I, I'm being optimistic that the Wings will now have, like I said, have an idea of how they are. I'm figuring that again. You just it's it's what 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 wings team is going to show up? Is it, or we're going to get that hungry defensive you know wings team that's been been that's been hungry to want to play? Or are we going to get a lackluster team that's been on back of a mill card? I mean, I don't know. I mean, um, again. You can't expect this offense that you know, bail you out, uh, out of every game. You have to step up at some point on defense. Uh, what you could, like I said, the, the goaltending, I mean, the defense needs to be there from the goaltending, and the goaltending needs to step up as well. You can't be uh, a one second too late, it is is crucial in this league. And you right now, you're, you're the playoffs are very, very slim to none. Right now, you're wanting to play leapfrog. You got to hope teams lose. You got to, right now, you're pretty much your playoffs start now. Right. So it's well, pal, we're going to thank you, as always, for uh, oh, gents. giving, giving, uh, take, taking it on the chin and, uh, you know, giving it to us. <laughs> Listen, uh, let's see. Let's start. Wings lost, Sixers lost, Phillies uh, doesn't mean it. Yeah, Flyers lost. It's happy hour somewhere, right? It's five o'clock somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the union tied, right? <laughs> the union tied. Oh, yeah. that, that's 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 two beers. Uh, let's <laughs> see. I mean, <laughs> I, it's just a it's cake. not a good day to be a Philly fan. A no, no, <laughs> it's not always sunny in Philly. I'll tell you that much. It, it's more like it's always raining here on the inside. So, but guys, listen. Let's hope for a win here uh, next week, and if not, uh, I'm taking my papers. I'm calling it quits. I mean, I'm done. I've had enough. I've had enough. I've had enough of losing and stressing out anymore. So, but guys, have a great rest of the show. I'll catch you guys next week. All right, and that was Pat with the Wings, the wings Nest. That was awesome. Uh, just before we get to some of the other NLL games, I want to get to uh, some of the uh, um, movement. Uh, that happened in the uh, in the NLL, and I also want to get to our pickums because, well, some <laughs> did well. Some of us did well. <laughs> My, how we picked ourselves up the, from the turf. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anyways, last week's players of the week, just to get them out of the way here, is Mark Matthews, who uh, against the Riptide had four goals and seven assists. He uh, was spectacular in that game. His best game as a Toronto Rock. The um, rookie of the week was Ty Kurtz. And he had a heck of a game also um, with three goals and four assists. The Rock made a trade this week, and it was the same day as the Riptide announced their uh, thing, so it kind of went under the radar. They picked up uh, Alex Q, Andrew's brother, uh, from the Buffalo Bandits, who's been uh, actually playing arena lacrosse league and uh, has been sitting on the practice squad for, uh, for Buffalo. And Buffalo receives a sixth-round pick, so it's more, I guess, a cleanup off of, off of uh, Buffalo's practice roster, but uh, <clears throat> with all the injuries Toronto's got, um, uh, he was actually put onto the lineup in yesterday's game, even though he was a healthy scratch. So, uh, luck is luck. <laughs> the band has made a, uh, another trade, and they picked up Corey Highfield from Rochester, in which they gave up their second round uh, pick in 2024, 
and their 2025 third round pick. A few signings. Um, Terrell Hammer Jackson has re signed with Vancouver. Uh, they need all the help they can get, so it's good to have him back. And Jake Fox uh, took a one year contract over to Halifax, I believe. Is it, guys? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. A few milestones. Shane Jackson got his 700th loose ball on uh, Friday's game in San Diego. Uh, Trevor Baptiste in that same game uh, now has 1,400 faceoff wins. 11th player to reach that. That's amazing. That's yeah. Oh, yeah. Didn't take 11th long. all time right now. Incredible. Now, here's a fun one because yesterday was not only Tom Schreiber's birthday, but he reached his 500th career NLL point yesterday as well on a goal. Great way to top off a birthday, eh? A win, a oh, goal, yeah. Absolutely. and a 500 career point. And uh, just staying on that birthday theme, uh, Rock coach Bruce Codd the day earlier, Friday, was his birthday. Happy birthday, Bruce. Spectacular coach. Uh, another... Orangeville, uh, Michigan Auto, too. Heavy with the Orangeville Northmen. Um, this one stood out to me, guys. Now, everybody, um, I listen to it all the time. Uh, Nick Rose is this. Nick Rose is that. Nick Rose is the other. Uh, let's put down it. Nick Rose is, uh, once again, first in the league. Uh, this is before yesterday's game of only giving up five goals <clears throat> of a 9.40 uh, goals against average leading the league. Chris Riglieri is second with a 9.73. Uh, Doug Jamison, uh, 10.51. Frank Scagliano with a 10.70. And Christian Del Bianco uh, behind all of those with a 10.78. So remember that in those arguments that you're having with uh, with people. Awesome. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Yeah. We're here weekly for you. Right, here we go. Oh, here, <laughs> here we go. go. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, just for you, Eduardo. Here we go. Pat me, five and three. Eduardo, six and two. Sean with the lead, seven and one. Muffler trying his best to be different. And three and five is where he went. <clears throat> Looking at the year to date, we still have uh, pretty much a wolf pack in there. Sean leading, 46 and 29. Pat right on his heels at 44 and 31. Eduardo just behind them at 43 and 32. Then we dip down, and there's good old Derry at 40 and 35, uh, keeping Mike company at 35 and 40. Don't worry. End of the season. It's going to all shift around. It's going to reverse. I can feel the good fortune. <laughs> just like I feel the sunny weather of San Diego. Wait a minute. San Diego's weather next weekend and Toronto's weather are almost the same. So I'm flying to the same. <laughs> I can't get that through my head, <laughs> but it's not here. So, you know, I'll be in San Diego uh, for the for the Rock game. Uh, um, there are some going to be uh, the braving it and doing the Las Vegas trip, and then taking a red eye and doing the Vegas and the San Diego trip. I'll be in San Diego on Friday. I'll be resting and watching that on my ESPN Plus or TSN Plus or whatever Plus I can get, and. Uh, Moving it from there. Anyways, moving moving right along. I'll be at the uh, I'll be at the Seals game on Saturday night though. Come by and say hi. Just look for the uh, the roadies ring. Win or lose, we drink the booze. <laughs> so this is beer drinking champion on a damn thing. So you know what? Uh, who might argue? <laughs> Not me anymore. I'll be a lightweight. Uh, anyways, let's get on to the rest of the games this week. Um, we'll start off over with the New York Riptide. And, um, well, a little bit of deja vu, guys. A little bit of deja vu. It looked an awful lot like, well, last week against the Toronto Rock, in which they started off great. And the second half, they got outscored 12-1. to They absolutely got annihilated. McLaughlin and Gibson each scored four in that game. Most of that happened in the second half. Because remember, uh, the Riptide went, I believe it was a 6-5 lead at the half. And what have we said forever? How do you stop the Riptide? Well, you stop Jeff T. And his eight-game hat-trick streak came to an end in that Colorado game because, uh, well, 
the defense uh, sure picked it up in the second, man. My goodness. Um, off the hop, though, uh, Larson Sundown, Riley O'Connor, very quickly had them out to a 2 0 lead. Um, the Craig and Robinson goals tied it up, but Austin Madronic and John LaFontaine gave them a 4 2 lead after one. Very, very clean game, guys. Very, very clean game. Said so Williams with a howitzer, made it 4 3. <clears throat> but then Connor Kiernan and Jeff Teat uh, made it 6 3 for New York, and it looked like they had this thing in hand. Uh, Eli McLaughlin got one back, but Jeff Teat got his second of the night. Uh, that'll be the end of us hearing from Jeff Teat. Uh, he was bottled up the rest of the evening. Connor Robinson and uh, Tyson Gibson got goals to make it 7-6 uh, for New York. And Connor Kiernan made it 8-6 at the half for New York. And things looked pretty rosy. Um, talking to Jeff Teat at the uh, intermission, you know, basically everything was going to be status quo. Well, that's probably right, but they didn't make adjustments, and Colorado did. And right from the word go, uh, they went to town. In the first two minutes, Tyson Gibson scored a pair of power play goals to tie this thing up. Uh, Kevin Brunell got one back, and then it was all Colorado until the end of this thing. Uh, Tyson Gibson on the power play again. Zed Williams, Dylan Kinnear, Connor Robinson, and it was 12-9 Colorado after three. Chris Wardle, Zed Williams on the power play yet again. Uh, Connor Kelly. And then Eli McLaughlin with a natural hat trick. Bang, bang, bang. In the span of about a minute and a half. And it was 18 to 9, and this thing was about over. Riley O'Connor got one back on the power play with a minute left. Way too little. Way too late. And uh, they bowled uh, Cam Dunkerley um, after the Robinson goal at the uh, end of the uh, third. And um, um, his name's eluding me now. Will Johnson. Will Johnson, that's right. He came in for about a minute and a half of the uh, third and all of the fourth. And uh, he didn't fare so well either. He gave up six goals on 15 shots. So, Yeah, and a bit of a double whammy for the Riptide. Um, they actually own Colorado's first-round pick, courtesy of that Tyson Gibson trade. Mm-hmm. Upcoming, so uh, a win over Colorado would have uh, would have yeah, done like would, would, would have done them some there. wonders. Yeah, yeah, would have you know um, would would have would have boosted that pick even higher. So um, <laughs> obviously yeah. they're going to hope that you know Colorado yeah. doesn't continue succeeding. <laughs> well, the Colorado team that we all but keep thinking is going to be here week in and week out. Yeah. Right? This is this is the team we we, we think is going to be there week in week out. The guys who are doing it are the guys are supposed to be doing it. You know, this best game I think Connor Robinson's had all year with seven yeah. points, yeah. three goals, four assists. Uh, Zed Williams with three goals and two assists. Even Connor Kelly, you know, one goal but six assists. You know, Tyson Gibson, Eli McLaughlin. We talked about that. McLaughlin with nine points, he had five assists to go with those four goals, and uh, Tyson Gibson with a pair of go- a pair of assists to go with his four goals. This is uh, a scary good team, and. Uh, you know, in two weeks' time, uh, they come into Toronto, and we'll see how they fare there. But uh, Toronto's uh, when we get to that game, uh, their scoring has uh, gone south. Dan Craig out uh, didn't realize he meant that much to the team. But uh, yeah. let's uh, let's deal with that in a little bit. Um, faceoffs. Colorado was uh, twenty-one of thirty-two. Um, that's something we haven't talked about much this year with them. Um, you know, they, uh, Tim Edwards is just on fire. Yeah. Yep. You know, and power plays. New York got into trouble with penalty trouble against Toronto. Same thing happened here. Colorado got four out of six. Um, that's a killer. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolute yeah. Killer. And it was all second half. You know, the first half they had themselves in check, and when things started going south, they started losing their composure. And, you know, we started seeing a New York riptide of the beginning of the season, which just did everything they could to shoot themselves in the foot. And that's two weeks in a row where they've only put in 30 minutes of work in a 60-minute game. Results are there. Yeah. Both blowouts. Yeah, and, you know, we talked about it last week. You know, Colorado, this is – 
this was the first in that stretch where they had five out of six games at home. Yeah. And we yeah. figured they probably needed to go at least four and two to even up their record, you know, with the last two being on the road. But, right. um, you know, obviously it's a good yeah. start. So <laughs> and that's know, the, they, that's they can do the, five, if they can do five and one, you know, one of those two road wins at the, in the last two games, will get them to nine and nine, which we think. Well, they, they pretty much need six yeah. wins. And that's done. the thing. They, they need to find their consistency, right? They had a great game here and that's how their whole season has been going. Great game. Not that's a great, so game. great game. Not a great game. Uh, if they just kind of find that groove again, they'll be fine. But All right. Let's uh, let's uh, move on, move on over. And uh, San Diego and Georgia played a hell of a game yeah. on Friday night. And uh, well, this is going to be a theme. Saturday morning. This is you know, <laughs> yeah. going to be a theme <laughs> about Georgia, you know. But uh, Berg's incredibly clutch uh, sock trick. Power Seals to dramatic win over the Swarm, including the uh, the OT winner. Yeah, it was a crazy, crazy game and back and forth. And there was a goaltending clinic between uh, Aurigulari and um, Dobson, which I think we kind of expected probably to the top of two kind of young up and coming goaltenders in the league. Right. Um, even though it was kind of back and forth, I mean, statistically, the Seals were dominant. They outshot Georgia 58 uh, 44. Uh, they were three for four on the power play. Baptiste did Baptiste type things, <laughs> 21 for 27 on the draws. Um, but yeah, then we uh, hit overtime and then it got kind of uh, wild and weird. <laughs> yeah, at uh, so 358 into overtime, it looked like Brendan Bonberry had scored to give Georgia the win. They uh, went to replay and determined that the ball did not cross the line before the shot clock expired. So it was waved off the very next possession. Westberg takes it down the floor, scores a sock trick goal for the game winner. Um, one other note I had here, um, even though it's a win for the seals, I mean, I, if you're a championship caliber team, you think you just want a bit more of an effort out of this. I look, their offense had a little left to desire. Only one goal from Austin Stotts, nothing from Dane Doby. Two from Curtis Dixon. I think those three guys you probably want to see a little bit more out of. Um, Austin Stotts was some frustrated, though, boy. Yeah. He, yeah Dobson had his number, and uh, there's times when he was just pounding on the back glass on things that just you know, nine times out of ten it goes in, and this time around was the one. Yeah. And like some other games we'll see, too, like there were an awful lot of posts hit. <laughs> that just, it was just a crazy, crazy game. Yeah, definitely. Really great games of both games on Friday night. Yeah. I was watching both of them, so um, love it. Can never get enough. Anyways, let's move ourselves over and um, the Firewolves and the Bandits. Now, this is the game of the week, right? Except that Matt Vince was hurt, and Devlin Shanahan took the uh, the net for the Bandits. Ty Kurtz nets a sock trick there, lead the Fire the Firewolves to a win in Bandit Land. Jamison scores a goal. That was another fun one. At the, we have about nine seconds left in the game, just fires it down the floor. I've watched Nick Rose do it a bunch of times. Nice to see somebody else do it. Put a little, little uh, salt to the wound, I guess. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, <laughs> Ty Kurtz had, you know, again, had the sock trick. Um, you know, Buffalo, some of their scores showed up. Uh Josh Byrne, three goals, three assists. Chris Cloutier had two and three. Dane Smith um, is kind of having these, this string of games where he's just not finding the back of the net, but he's facilitating a lot. So uh, six assists on the night. Uh, Devon Shanahan had 46 saves in place of Matt Vince. Um, uh, do we know? <laughs> do Upper we body know injury could about? be four to six weeks, oh, they're okay. saying. Could be four to six weeks. weeks. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's big. That's big. But you know, Buffalo has that. Uh, uh, well, you can always use Stephen Orleman. You got him there. You got him too. Yeah. You got Jeff, yeah. Shannon, Shanahan. So I got a feeling well, we're going to see. Yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely interesting because uh, you know, obviously the 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 loss you know does a couple of things. I mean, drops them to five hundred. They're now in 
a tie for sixth place at five and five. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just looking at some of their remaining games um, at Vancouver, home against Sask, home against Toronto. That's going to be a big revenge game. That will be. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> then they're at Panthers. Yeah, they're at Panther City, at Philly, at Colorado. That's going to be another revenge game. Right. And then they finish home against Calgary and at Las Vegas. So maybe the last couple of games we're gonna, you know, we'll see Matt Vince back by then. But um, certainly a lot not of people Matt Vince be at that point though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly not not the easiest stretch, you know. And, and you know, like I said, now they're looking at you know they're tied for sixth place with Calgary, who's suddenly surging after looking like <laughs> they were headed yeah. nowhere. So, and you're looking at a lot of teams in that back end. You're looking at a lot of teams in that back end too that are just gonna be like scratching and clawing for a playoff spot. So they're gonna be desperate. That's yeah. the beauty of this system, right? Is yeah. that uh, you know you can do that. Whereas before in division, you're kind of stuck. You know, it's only only one or two teams that you you need to leapfrog. And here, there's a whole mess of them. So all these games matter. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if anything, you know, I mean, the other thing I look at too with with uh, with Albany is yeah, it's great to see Nanako back. Yeah. The other thing I look at with Albany is, you know, clearly, you know, they're showing that they're not worried about going into other people's barns and coming out with a win. <laughs> no, you know, they're, they're, they're one of only, uh, I believe it's only them in Toronto right now that are undefeated on the road. Right. So funny. Toronto's usually unbeatable at home. Yeah. And their two losses are there. <laughs> Yeah, and San Diego actually with that win over Georgia is still the only undefeated team at home. But that's pretty much it for home and road as far as every other team other than those uh he's some some kind well, of that's, a, that's the whole thing I was just gonna say about Albany that just is so awesome to see. You know, you got young guys like Ty Kurtz and um uh yeah um and Simmons Marshall yeah. Paula Simmons, those guys just young guys that just you know, went into a defending champions barn with no fear and just laid it to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're not afraid to mix it up because there was a real good uh, fight in there. Watkinson had a great fight in there. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you can throw him down real nice, real nice guy, but, uh, you know, piss him off and, uh, well, yeah, just take a look at what yep. can be done. And that whole team, yeah. I think that whole team is under the age of 31, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, Glenn Clark is yeah. a, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't get enough credit, really. He's a uh, a master at this because just take a look at what he did last year with nothing, with all the injuries and everything like that, yeah. and working with the right people and trying to weave together the right thing, knowing what he had to come. And don't forget, he still got the biggest piece coming, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the piece to the puzzle they're yeah. building around hasn't even come in yet. Yeah, and, uh, and that's gonna, scary. That's scary. Yeah, and I was going to say too. They're also doing this. No Tanner Thompson. No Charlie Kitchen. Yep. No yeah. Kieran McArdle because he retired. And a couple of years, yeah. a couple of games, they had no Doug Jameson, and they had to go elsewhere in net, and they were able to survive that too. So, you know, it's great to have Jameson back because he looked he looked like he had missed a game, you know, the yeah. last couple. So, spectacular stuff, and uh, you know, sky's the limit, really. And uh, again, yeah. Albany yeah. looks determined. Absolutely. Don't forget Ethan Walker. Yeah. Ethan yes. Walker, yeah. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. Both GM and coach. And our dog. Yeah. Yeah. And the, 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 thing, yeah. the thing I that really. Huge too. Last year, had been hurt all year. And that was the big any... difference last year. That was the big difference last year, is not having yeah. Ardella. Uh, that was Ardella. the start of things to fall apart there. Yeah. Remember, because you put a, you ticked on the wind column when you saw Albany was coming. Now you're taking on the other column because they're they're just I I'm really I'm I'm looking I'll be in Rochester that night but I'm looking forward to the uh, the Rock and uh, Albany coming together and seeing uh, really the best offense is offense against the best defense and two really great goalies should be a a, a real interesting kind of game yeah yeah so, all right speaking of the Rock uh, it was Indigenous Heritage Night and uh, again I have uh, before I put that up, I guess. Uh, you know, great artistry. You know, beautiful artistry. Absolutely. Um, their auction goes on until Tuesday. If you want to go onto the Toronto Rock site, 
Um, there's still some things that are affordable. Nothing like the Frank Brown jersey from uh, Buffalo that went for five hundred and five dollars. <laughs> Unbelievable! Some of the prices that were were there in U.S. funds. Um, if you do it from the U.S., uh, you get it at a bargain basement price because it's in Canadian funds here, so it's almost all half price for you guys. Um, I think um, Justin Martin is the um, hard to believe. His is the highest. I think it was twenty four hundred when I looked at it. Uh, Nick Rose was like 700. I think Challen Rogers was at uh, <clears throat> 13 or 1400. A number of them there were uh, two or 300. I think it started at 200 and 250 or something like that. So a number of them were in around the 300 and 400 mark. So still affordable. Shorts and helmets also in there. A number of the shorts were still at 40 or 50 bucks. Uh, that'll probably go up to 100 by the time we're done on Tuesday. I think Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, it is over. So if you're looking for uh, really great jersey, and uh, here it is on there. Uh, just a sweet jersey. You know, they yeah, did a yeah. really nice job once again. I have one from uh, a couple of years back, and gorgeous, gorgeous. All kinds of compliments on it. But Schreiber leads away with two goals, four assists as the Rock beat the Warriors. <clears throat> First team in the league to eight wins, uh, but they uh, were joined by Albany very quickly, uh, just because they finished uh, quickly. Um, the uh, the Rock. And Vancouver uh, had the slowest half that I had ever had to sit through. Uh, it was 2-2 at the half. And not a heck of a lot going on in uh, in that particular half. Interestingly enough, um, I had, uh, was talking with Brad McCulley before the game, and I had given him one of the all-across T-shirts. And uh, he was uh, just stretching and um, doing some stuff and shoot-arounds. Well, he felt a twinge in his back, and he went for a shot, and he seized right up. So he was a, a scratch uh, prior to game time, so he didn't play. And uh, that was one of the things that really hampered uh, Vancouver to have that grit and those hands in the lineup. Um, really, uh, you know, come the second half, though, all of a sudden Toronto uh, started uh, waking up a little bit. Again, my screen isn't working here, guys. Very odd. Very, very odd. They're giving me uh, all the Toronto stats for the year. <laughs> but, um, you know, hang tight. I have, I have myself covered. Don't worry. <laughs> Where there's a will, there's a way. Um, all right. Sorry. Uh, in the third corner, Toronto opened up the second half scoring with Josh Dalwick firing a laser off a Tom Schreiber pass. Marley Anglis uh, with a quick stick, and it was 4-2 on a delayed penalty there. The Warriors scored on the power play themselves when Ryan Martel fired a blistering shot from the outside off a Keegan ball pass. But the Rock got it back when Tom Schreiber fired another blast from the side of the net off a Mark Matthews pass. That was Tom Schreiber's 500th career point. After uh, three quarters, Toronto was up 5-3, and it looked like things were kind of sorting themselves out. Nick Rose quietly was spectacular in this game. He made 45 saves facing 50 shots. Just incredible. Um, Vancouver opened up the fourth quarter scoring with uh, two quick ones. Kyle, Kyle Killen uh, fired a Kevin Crowley feed 29 seconds in, followed by Riley Lowen with a beautiful shot uh, just uh, from in front uh, to tie the game 31 seconds later. But uh, the Rock got it back very, very quickly uh, just a couple of seconds later um, when Tom Shriver blasted a uh, a uh, low-to-low shot that just uh, worm burner into the corner, uh, followed by Mark Matthews with an outside shot off a Justin Martin pass. Chris Bushy added to the uh, to lead, picking a far corner off a Tom Schreiber pass, uh, followed by Brandon Slade, who scored in transition. Now, originally they uh, reviewed this thinking that he uh, might have put his foot in the crease, but uh, luckily uh, his feet aren't that big. And uh, it was deemed a good goal. And that was the way it ended, 9-5 uh, Toronto in a very low-scoring affair. Toronto has all kinds of injury problems, guys. Um, the injury bug has hit them huge. Josh Jubinville out. Challen Rogers out four to six weeks. Dan Craig uh, and Mitch DeSnew were both put on the uh, the IR after uh, morning shoot-arounds. Um, Tyler Hendricks still out. Latrell Harris is out for the year. Chase Siobhan, who they drafted, he's out. Jordan McKenna's been out all year. Lots of injuries. Uh, lots of new faces. Marley Angus looked really good pulling him up from the ALL. Another reason for the ALL to be there. He was game-shaped, game-ready for this. 
Uh, Cam Milligan was brought up, but he was a healthy scratch for this game as well. Um, looking at some of this game stats for the end of the game, um, Warriors outshot Toronto 50 to 45. Uh, the faceoff battle was won. TD Erlin uh, uh, doubled them up uh, 12 to 6. Uh, the loose ball battle, Toronto won 60 to 52. Vancouver went one for two on the power play, but had a shorthanded goal. Uh, Toronto went one for four on the power play. And that was the way that was, guys. So the Rock have eight wins on the year. I want to go to the uh, Las Vegas-Rochester game next. Because this one, uh, I was sure Rochester was coming guns a-blazing. I would be incorrect. <laughs> Second half, and that was it, eh? Uh, Hellier's big night of three goals, three assists, powers the Desert Dogs to a road win over Connor Fields with his three goals and three assists, and the Night Hawks. Well, second half, but really it was, I mean, really it came down to the fourth quarter. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they were tied 8-8 after three quarters, and, uh, you know, Las Vegas pretty much put the game away with a four-goal run uh, in the fourth. And uh, Landon Kells just shut the door on the Nighthawks at the end of the game, you know. And, uh, you know, for for as much as the Nighthawks have been losing, you know, this is now their sixth straight loss after a 3-0 and start. They're now 3-6. and uh, You know, most of those games, they've at least kept things close and, you know, or, or at least found themselves battling back in the fourth quarter and, and keeping things close. Uh, but you know, to, to, to it's obvious that it makes it maybe a little more demoralizing that, you know, that they're, you're taking your sixth straight loss and you couldn't do anything in the fourth quarter to, to stay in the game. But, uh, uh, Rob Hellier had, uh, three goals, three assists, uh, Zach Greer, five assists on the night. Um, you had Jack Hanna with two goals and three assists. Um, Dylan Watson had two goals and assists. Like I said, uh, Landon Kells, 47 saves on the night. Uh, for Rochester, Connor Fields showed up three and three. Ryan Smith had two and four. Uh, you got a goal and an assist each from Kyle Waters, Dan Lomas, Thomas McConvey. But uh, yeah, eight, eight goals. <laughs> Just ain't good to get you too far. Wouldn't have even beat Toronto. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> My goodness. So Toronto is the bunt the punchline now. <laughs> With their lack of scoring. When when transition doesn't work and you're missing Dan Craig, uh Toronto doesn't have any scoring. Eh? Tom yeah, and, 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 and I mean the reality for Rochester, unfortunately, it doesn't get any easier. <laughs> uh, their next three games are at Panther City, and then they have a home and home with Albany. So <laughs> I'm just uh, amazed that you know that, that Rochester is not scoring like they can. Yeah, you know, you take a look at it and their lineup, and Curtis Knight is back, right? Which is probably one of the reasons why you saw Corey Highfield go away, um, just to make room in their in their lineup. But uh, you know, Lanchbury. Knight, Fields, McConvey, Austin Hazen. You know, these are all high scorers. Brian Smith. You know, yeah. there's a lot of scoring on that team. For them to be shut down altogether, just uh, it goes, it's starting to show me that maybe it is coaching in there because it's going yeah. down to the place. It's not the talent because these guys can put them in by the bushel. And it's weird because I know the goaltending doesn't score goals. And Hutchcraft, I mean, he's not playing terrible, but it seems like ever since Hartley went down, it seems just to have been messed with their mojo type of thing. <clears throat> a little bit, yeah. Um, Hutchcraft, he had 28 saves on a night. Um, you know, again, Riley can get really hot, and he was really great at the beginning of the year. Um, I don't know if not having that regular um, week in week out thing for so long um, and fatigue is setting in. I don't know, but um, you know, something has to, something has to give here. And Doug Buckham is their backup. So I don't think that's the answer. So I don't know. Only getting, we got 40 shots. 
that's not unreasonable. That's not Zach Higgins' uh, numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, something's got to give because uh, that's, uh, we said, was six, six in a row? Yeah, that's, yeah. yep, yep. They started this. So they won their first three and they've dropped six straight since then. So that's frightening. That's yeah. frightening. That shouldn't happen. Yeah. It's too talented a team for it to happen. Yeah, and like I said, you know, at Panther City, then they're home against Albany, then they're at Albany. So rough. Could could be yeah. nine in a row. And then after that, it's at Colorado and then home against Halifax. Yeah, the so, right side isn't consistent, is for sure. Yeah, that is absolutely. dead on 100 percent And again, the dogs aren't a bad team. But again, I, I would say that they're not the most consistent team in the world either. And mm-hmm. um, you know, if you are in the upper or supposed to be in the upper echelon of the league. Uh, that's a game that you should be putting as a, we should be winning this game. And they were, and it just stopped. Yeah. So I don't know if, uh, again, adjustments being made or adjustments not being made at the half. And Sean Williams figured it out. And Mike Hazen and his staff didn't. And I'm seeing that all too much. <laughs> Out of that now, yeah, you know, and, yeah. We're, and and I mean, we've already we've already had this once, you know, in the last couple of weeks where you know people came on commenting, yeah, oh, you know, fire Hazen, maybe it's time to coach and change, and who are you going to find at this point? No, midseason, you're not yeah. going to find anybody. Uh, you have to look internally. Better, better <laughs> all you can do, you know, where 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 where, where are your where are your coaching candidates right now? I mean, who? Unless you want to look outside the NLL box. Yeah. So, you know, I've heard a number of guys who used to be coaches and have been general managers and coaches in MSL say um, the guys who are in there just recycled in and around. They don't look anywhere else other. So maybe it's time that uh, they look a little further up. Guys, I, uh, I apologize. I had a press conference from The Rock that I forgot to put up. So bear with me for a second. Uh, Nick Rose and uh, I believe Chris Bushy. Yeah, I mean they uh, present a lot of challenges. Um, they're they're going to start winning some games in this league uh, this year. Um, big defense, obviously, and they that young kid in net played uh, his best game of his career. Happy for him. I, I've known him a long time, and uh, yeah, he he kind of stood on his head in the first half and the second half really. But um, yeah, we just couldn't kind of break open and offensively and. Uh, to be fair, like we we were getting lots of good good opportunities, but that's just kind of how the game goes sometimes. Uh, you guys found out no Mitch this new, no Challen Rodgers, no Dan Craig. Uh, definitely was a fun full display here tonight. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we've kind of been dealing with stuff like this all season. Obviously, Tommy and Corb's out a while, and Jubes, and list goes on and on. So um, it's the old cliche, uh, like kind of next man up, and uh, yeah, we we got enough in in the dressing room to kind of win on any given night, no matter who's in the lineup. So, um, yeah, it's good to get the result, but, yeah, proud of everybody stepping up. Jay touched on it because uh, it's you know, no matter who you have back there, there's just so much depth, and there's very little difference in, in their play. Yeah, I mean, we obviously have great systems, great coaches. That, that kind of leads to that. But, um, yeah, we got young guys that kind of step in and, and uh, don't miss a beat, right? And, uh, no, like, Noah Kearney obviously hasn't played – much defense in his uh, life, not let alone uh, in his NL career so far. So um, he's uh, he's been coming in, playing awesome the few games he's got. And um, yeah, I mean, we just uh, we know what we got back there, and uh, when we play the systems, uh, good things happen. Speaking about the jaw, the defense they're holding a good Vancouver offense to, to under ten. Yeah, I mean, uh, they they got a bunch of good shooters, and they uh, they might have outshot us tonight. Like they they work hard up there and keep grinding you down and. Um, we did a good job kind of not giving them a ton of repeat possessions, I felt. Um, even though they were getting lots of shots, we were kind of getting those loose balls and uh, away we go. So, um, yeah, it's never easy in this league. Every every weekend uh, you're playing three or four kind of top player, top offensive players in the league. So um, for us to do that tonight was uh, great. And then tonight also Indigenous Heritage tonight. Uh, how beautiful are those jerseys and playing with some meaning behind tonight's game. Yeah, the jerseys this year are awesome, like usual. Um, it's always a great uh, special night for us here. Um, heard uh, we, we raise a lot of money for uh, charities and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's always special to kind of put on uh, um, a jersey that kind of means more than, than yourself, you know. 
how important was it for you to hold down the board, especially until the offense got going, and how good were you feeling in the crease? Um, I was seeing the ball pretty good, obviously, in the first half, and then they, they uh, scored a few, I guess, early in the in the fourth that kind of tied things up. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's just NL all. you got to kind of grind away, and um, really, really, that's just my job, to, <laughs> to hold the fort, regardless what uh, we're doing on offense. So um, the fact that it was kind of a tight game, uh, yeah, just more so just doing my job. A big road trip next weekend, San Diego and Vegas back-to-back. How do you keep it rolling into next week? Yeah, it's obviously going to be a tough weekend just on the bodies, um, but, I mean, we're going to have to play a back-to-back come playoff time uh, if, if we get in there. So um, we we got to be ready, and, uh, yeah, we obviously got to put a big focus on uh, Friday night, and we can't get two without one. So we, we, we're just focused on going into Vegas and doing a job there, and then we'll worry about San Diego. Yeah, it's been the story of our of our season so far. Um, just not really having a, a good start. I think we start playing good lacrosse when – we get a little pissed off, um, so naturally, maybe we just try and go into each game a little with a little chip on our shoulder moving forward. Uh, talk about the resiliency of this group. You have no Mitch Disnew, no Dan Craig tonight. It seemed like you guys didn't miss a beat. Yeah, having them out, um, Jubes, Chow, Latrell, um, you know, Corpse for the beginning of the season. Like, there's lots of uh, lots of people out, um, but you know, we got a we got a good group. We got a deep team. Um, showed that tonight. And then tonight was Indigenous Heritage Night. How cool is it to don a jersey with significant meaning behind it and honor the the Indigenous roots of this game? Yeah, it's it's always amazing. Um, this is my you know fifth season in the league now, so anytime those games roll around, um, it's cool to be a part of. Um, I've lived in Canada and the GTA for most of my life. You know, I've always played against Six Nations, you know, Aquasasni, um, Kanawage, and you know all those uh, all those places. So learning something new about their heritage and their culture every year. So, um, yeah, I think it's a great, great thing for the sport as well. He's our, not to pun unintended, but he's our rock back there, right? He's, you know, so great night in and night out for, you know, better part of what's this, 12, 13 years now, something like that on his career. So um, we have full trust in him and he trusts us just as equally. So um, it's nice to have a guy back there to rely on like that. I think part of it too became was that that team, that other locker room, they had their sticks in your face all night. Yeah, they're a big team. They're like probably pound for pound, maybe they've got the, the tallest and, and heaviest average on, on at least the D end. Um, so when we're running up against a bunch of guys that are, you know, 6'2 at the very least, 225, 230 pounds, um, you got to adjust your game a little bit. Um, and they're mean and they're tough. So I think, you know, adjusting our game to kind of match that level of physicality uh, is a good test for us. And that was uh, Chris Bucci with the Toronto Rock talking about the Vancouver defense. He's got a good point there. They are huge. Our team is humongous. Yeah. yeah. And they will get it right. Uh, don't you despair. <laughs> so, you know, a couple of bad calls and a couple of bad plays and uh, that changed the whole complexion. But, uh, you know, they held a powerful Rock team to under 10. That's uh, a... Yeah impressive in my eyes all right let's uh let's move on guys still got a few games to go um sean yeah what the <laughs> hell happened to Saskatchewan? my god yeah, no kidding this thing was uh, I was something needs to change. Three, nothing holy smokes 19 to 6 that's more than triple thunderbird yeah. rushed by 13 banesh four goals to assist the youthful teenage ryan banesh uh, Clark Peterson, three goals, four assists. Stotts, three goals, three assists, leading the scoring. There you go. Yeah. Uh, what else can you say? Halifax <laughs> 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 was up 11 to four by the half. It wasn't even close. Um, I imagine no, beer sales went through the roof. Yeah. A lot of people were leaving early. I'm not going to tell you that. And, um, you know, we're talking attendance. That's probably the lowest attendance I've seen at a rush game in a while. And something like that happening is not helping the matters. Um, Frank Chiliano was, wasn't seeing the ball. And it was all around. I mean, defense was given all sorts of time and space. Um, Chiliano really wasn't seeing the ball. You're seeing errant passes on offense. And just, yeah, it was all around a bad game. And um, I'm not sure if you have the clips from Jimmy Quinlan, but I mean, I they knew they weren't going to win that face off battle. They just knew that they had to get that stop off the face-off, and they didn't do it. 
plain and simple. I have the Quinlan presser that you got for us, and uh, let's listen to Jimmy Quinlan on this one. Yeah, we had a plan going in, and we didn't really um, execute it. Uh, they're they're a tough team to play. Um, we 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 knew well in advance that we would. Uh, struggle in the face-off dot, so we, we we had a plan, and again, um, it involved getting stops and then taking care of the ball and executing uh, when, when it came our turn, and uh, we just didn't execute, really, at the end of the day. Um, and it's bizarre, because we looked quite good, you know, last night in practice and this morning in, in shoot-around, so it's a bit of an anomaly of what happened. Um, and then, yeah, we fell behind early, and it, they're, they're a tough team to come back on just because of, again, um, the, the possession battle, and so... Uh, we didn't execute, and that's what happens in this league when you don't execute against a very good team. What's the message moving forward? Obviously, this is a team that had one two in a row. Now come out yeah, we're, we still believe we're a really good team. Um, we've parked this one. Already. We're moving on. We're looking forward to uh, getting on the road and then going down to Colorado and play a team who, who won a big game last night. And, uh, Again, getting back on, on track, and we're, we're happy to be playing lots of lacrosse here without any breaks uh, coming down the coming down the stretch. Can you mentioned that face-off thought. How do you defend against a guy like Jake, who's so good at face-off? Well, I mean, that was our plan. Our plan was to make the face-off irrelevant. It, it, as funny as that says, I mean, for people who watch the game, the, the, the face-off is very relevant because, again, if you're winning the face-offs, you're starting with possessions. But the way we see it uh, and, and the way we broke it down to our guys and the way we talked about it was if – you know, they start the game and win the first faceoff, and we get a stop, and we go down. Well, the possessions are 1 1. The only place you really start to kind of get into trouble is when you don't get stops and you turn the ball over. And we did that way too many times in terms of execution. And again, it wasn't bad opportunities. We ran by some of their players. We had three on twos. We had two on ones. We had breakaways. We just did not execute. And Again, that becomes really hard because now when you, you, you miss that opportunity, it goes the other way, they get the ball, and if they execute, they're starting with the ball. Uh, you know, they're going to start with the ball again. And so it, it compounds itself, but really at the end of the day, um, it was our execution in, in those moments that just led to them getting additional possessions, and uh, we just couldn't get enough stops. Thank you. Well, you know, it takes a uh, real man to... <laughs> After a beating like that, to there is, and talk yeah. talk about it. And I, I would say what he said uh, before the press conference because there's a lot of frustration going on right now. And um, and yeah, I think you brought up in your pickums, Gary, and I said the same thing. Like the rush had to get to Warren Hill early in this game, and again, yeah. didn't happen. Uh, yeah, if you let him settle in, you're dead. didn't happen. Yeah, you're dead in the water in this thing, and that's uh, Saskatchewan. I, I gotta say, you know, because we've been bugging, uh, bugging you about the turf, and uh, when they wear those green uniforms with that green turf, and it's like green screen, it's like just sticks <laughs> floating around there. With uh, I don't see anybody. Out there. Well, yeah, I I always said this about Calgary. I don't know how you can track a white ball on that teal turf. That's got to be painful for goaltenders. Yeah, and if the lighting's not just so, you know, you're going to be you know eating a lot of those shots, eating a lot yeah. of those passes because. Yeah, I've played in some arenas like that, and it's just, you know, very difficult to see it coming at you. You know, with the lighting, that's not not the greatest. Yeah. Sad but true. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine they don't all have Air Canada sound lighting. Scotiabank. <laughs> Roger Center. <sorry. laughs> Rogers owns everything. <laughs> Even though they don't own it, they will own it. They will own it eventually. Sooner, yeah. sooner or later, it's going to be in their pockets. <laughs> Anyways, that brings us to our final game, which happened just this afternoon. And once again, uh, <laughs> controversy, controversy yeah. and confusion and all kinds of things. Panther City takes this thing 10-9 and uh, back and forth thing. Crawford scores a game-winning goal with 40 seconds left. In my eyes, it should never have come down to the last couple of seconds where the controversy was. Georgia had a, a two-goal lead with about a minute and a half to go. And they fell apart defensively, and they gave up three goals, and uh, that's all she wrote. Let alone the controversy. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah, Panther City. You know they <laughs> they 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 reeled off. I mean, I I was I was pretty certain that. Uh, 
that Gary was uh, was going to be able to circle that pick on as correct. <laughs> oh, Being like, the only one with him, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, I fell on the yeah, sword. On I, mean, I mean, I mean, talk talk about a rally. I mean, they the Panther City pretty much went scoreless in the third quarter, a uh, good chunk of the second quarter. Uh, you know, after taking uh, like a six-two lead. And uh, just they the <laughs> turned it turned a switch, you know, in the last couple of minutes, and uh, they they get the ten nine lead, and then uh, let's talk about those we'll last fifteen into, seconds or so. Yeah, fifteen seconds. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, so, uh, they only gave us about nine seconds worth of uh, worth of footage uh, when they were showing us the uh, when we were trying to find a a highlight. So the highlight is useless to us because the infraction. Happened before the the video starts. So okay. correct, correct. So so Georgia had the ball with about I don't know sixteen seconds remaining or so, mm-hmm. and at some point, uh, Seth Oaks entered the crease. He was not in possession of the ball at the time, but Georgia did have possession of the ball. Uh, the ball gets passed to him and he takes a shot and beats Nick Damood five hole to seemingly tie the game. But that, that goal is waved off basically due to a crease violation. And but that's not how they explained it. No, no. it's not. And, no, they, they, and they got that lot, backwards. Yeah. Wrong. A lot happened, you know, that the, the call was made and um, you know, the camera cut to kind of a close up of Nick Damood. Uh, so, really the aftermath was kind of missed too. Um, His clearing attempt with uh, only a few seconds remaining was actually intercepted by a Georgia player who was, you know, pretty much on the doorstep and uh, they took a shot and that shot bounced off the post (laughs) and uh, basically kept the game 10, nine Panther city ran out the clock and, you know, mass confusion ensued uh, because everyone seemed to think that Georgia had tied up the game. Uh, the ref, you know, does her video review, but the video review he was doing was of the final shot by the Georgia player who had intercepted Damood's clearing attempt and not Seth Oak's apparent goal after having gone through the crease and then being the next guy to touch the ball. Because that's, I was going to say, that's the thing is even then they were looking at Seth Oak's shot and whether it went off the crossbar, which it clearly didn't. You could see that go. You had to go back even further to the previous shot when Seth Oak was in the crease and Andrew Q picked up the ball to see whether it was, did, Oaks get out of the crease and establish himself before Q got possession. Because if Q got possession while he's in the crease, then yeah, he's not eligible. So, yeah, there's a lot of so, things that went wrong there. Yeah, which, so yeah. It brought up a good point that, uh, that we talked about off air that you uh, that you made, Sean, is should we be going like hockey to a central office that reviews? Yeah, stuff? because I... Like Mike uh, had mentioned to us off the air, like the ref was going off what his official had called. Well, now you have to make you as an official have to make a judgment call on your officials. And now is there really an impartial decision? I hope it is, made? but you know, yeah. human human is human, right? Yeah, yeah, especially in a situation like that where you probably really don't want to admit you made a mistake. Should it maybe go to a neutral third party up in the booth? to look at that and say, yes, it's a good goal. No, it's a good goal. Those guys can also look probably back and say, no, we shouldn't be looking at the shot. We should be looking at the previous shot before that to see whether the crease violation happened. Yeah. Cause everything gets reviewed under two minutes. So everything gets reviewed under two minutes. Yeah. So yep. when you're, when you're reviewing one thing and we're talking about something else, um, can you imagine that happening mid game? I know. No. <laughs> so, Let's not make well, no, but, well yeah. no, but at the same time, if it was mid-game, a coach would have the ability to throw the challenge flag. Mm-hmm. In this yeah. case, Ed Como couldn't throw the challenge flag. 
No, but everything gets reviewed. So yeah, and that's part of the problem too, right? If, if they would have went to the coach and say, "What do you want to review?" Cuomo would have said, "I want to look at the crease violation, not the." The rebound shot off the clearing attempt. Which, by the way, never got reviewed because he was reviewing the other thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to see the replay of that, too. So that's why Colvin was so mad afterwards, because they completely reviewed the wrong the wrong <laughs> play. And, and he would have told them so if they would have went to the bench and said, hey, what do we need to review here? Well, you would, you would hope that the, they were watching the game, too, and seeing what actually needs to be reviewed. Yeah. Anyways, um, I'm uh, personally, it's not the first time I've heard that, that we need uh, a central office for reviews. You know, I've heard that a number of times from a number of sources. And I'm more inclined to agree with it, watching this more and more. It doesn't necessarily have to be like, say, a game in Saskatchewan, we have to oh, call, you know, the command center in Toronto. You just have a guy upstairs in the booth of the TV. That's all you need. It's not that hard to do. Right. Right. It's also might stop some of these three and four and five minute challenges. Yeah. If you can't see it in the first minute and a half, um, looking at it in you know the same angles again and again and again and again for another four minutes. It's inconclusive. Um, when, well, when uh, obviously the, the coach that's doing it is trying to not use a timeout. Yeah. You know, or trying to stop something when you don't have them. So, you know, it's like pulling a goalie. And putting them back in, just trying to get that break and breather in there, just little tiny tricks. But, uh, anyways, we got another busy week coming up next week, guys. Yeah, and just just before you uh, you roll off those games, I I do want to mention with, with Georgia. I mean, the two losses dropped them to five hundred at six and six, and yeah. now we're running into that uh, that stretch that we talked about, where basically. You know, they're at Halifax next, and then their last five are at home. So, um, you know, they're, they're going to be they're, they're, need games, though, now because of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, 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 I mean, but they're still what happened pretty to Georgia scoring, though. They have so much talent, <clears throat> and just like Toronto, and just there's so much inconsistency in this league that, they, you know, you got Lyle Thompson, you got Shane Jackson, you got Andrew. These guys should be, you know, they're so talented, as well as some of the other, you know, more sound than not. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree. Um, uh, Sh- uh, Jackson, I don't believe, found the back of the net. I think he only had a couple of assists. And he's had several games like that this year where, you know, kind of similar to Dean Smith. Where yeah. just you got yeah. no goals, but you know, you've got well, Seth Oaks didn't have a goal. Oh, he had one assist. Yeah. You know, he so, might have had a goal, but he didn't have a goal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Brian yeah. Cole won a goal. Andrew Q two goals. Lyle Thompson three goals. Um, then you go down their list and uh well, yeah. Bombery a couple of assists. Yeah. <laughs> Not a whole lot. Two assists for Jackson. Yeah. Not a whole lot of anything going on. No. Yeah. You know, just I, I, I saw so much promise from that team, especially in the uh, after the first couple of games. I saw such promise, and then it's just kind of pulled back. And I'm wondering what's different. And I can't put my finger on it because I don't see they're not injury prone. They don't have a lot of injuries there. They're still running the same, <clears throat> same systems. Is that the problem? Their team is getting wise to. Out. To the tapes, if you're not getting anything different, okay, well, I know how to defend them, don't I? I have a, a blueprint right here. So, um, let's see. Let's see what they do yeah. next week. They have Halifax on Friday, and that's not going to be an easy one. Halifax obviously is rolling and scoring, and yeah. all the uh, the weapons that they have are coming to fruition. So, that's going to be an interesting one. Here's where it gets interesting, guys, because you thought that it was just Toronto with this uh, this back-to-back thing that's going to kill them. But San Diego is playing in Panther City on Friday. So they're flying to the southeast to uh, to play there before playing Toronto at home on Saturday in the southwest. Uh, Toronto, at least, is uh, probably flying out like tomorrow to Vegas. And then they play uh, in San Diego the next night. So they don't have near as 
as bad a travel other than the initial. So that's uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so I, believe, I, I believe Panther City also has a doubleheader this weekend, too. I believe yeah, nobody, yeah, nobody gets there. So, they do, yeah. yeah. They do. They play yeah, Rochester. So, <laughs> so both 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 San Diego and Panther City all have double headers this weekend. Well, at least Panther City is staying home for both games. Right. Yeah. And they, if they want sleep in the arena, there'll be nobody to disturb them. <laughs> Very quiet. Indeed. Very quiet. <laughs> it's insomniac paradise there. <laughs> um, Buffalo plays Vancouver in Vancouver. That's going to be interesting because uh, both teams are kind of struggling right now. And um, the way the Vancouver defense is playing, I don't know, man. If there's an upset in the making, that one would be an earth-rocking yeah. one. If we would be talking next, uh, oh, by the way, next Sunday, because I am flying home from San Diego in the afternoon, the show will be on at 10 p.m. Eastern, not 9, 10 p.m. next week, just for the one week. So um, I'll be here probably with my luggage still in hand. <laughs> Stay tuned for that one. But uh, yeah, if if uh, if we're talking about next week about this earth-shattering upset, this is the game, Buffalo and Vancouver. And if Miloski can uh, can get them riled up enough, there's enough scoring power to uh, you know go against Orleman or Shanahan. Vince, maybe not. Orleman or Shanahan, possibly. And uh, if that defense, which is the biggest in the league, can make it difficult for the uh, the bandits to get inside. Um, anything's possible, but if they let Byrne and Fraser and and Smith run free, this is over in the first quarter. It's just that easy. Yep. Yeah. We move into Saturday, and Calgary is in Philadelphia for the uh, back end of the home and home. And we're already talking about that with Pat. That there's already a lot of bad blood, and this one could be a real barn burner, so to speak. Um, New York is in Albany. Now, which New York team shows up? The team that plays 30 minutes or the team that plays 60 minutes that won three games the, uh, prior to this two-game losing streak? And is Albany going to be able to hold Jeff Teat? Is Stephen Keogh going to make a, his presence felt? All kinds of little questions here. And is Albany going to be as ferocious as they have been? Personally, I think Albany is going to be very ferocious. That's just me. Here's the one for you, Sean. <clears throat> Saskatchewan, Colorado. Yeah. Two inconsistent teams both which heading teams, different directions at the moment. Which teams show up? Exactly. Yeah. In the Loud House at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern, which is a nice time for you, 7 p.m., I believe, in your time, is it? That's the Saskatchewan game is 8 our time. 8 your time. Yeah. I'm never sure when time changes. And yep. things like that. Yeah, because you, so <laughs> you so the people change your clocks. <laughs> Yeah, we're getting there. A couple weeks and we, uh, we get to go back to the normal thing there. Yeah. We're daylight again. It's a wonderful thing. I hear it. It's lovely. <laughs> and then, of course, there's Toronto in San Diego. I will be at that game, uh, hopefully in the press box, but I will be also with the roadies. So I will be jumping around in that arena. Uh, should be a fun time. Looking forward to it. Just to, just to get out there. I loved San Diego when I was there for the World Field Championship, so I'm looking to get back out there and seeing some uh, some friends. And then, of course, we talked about Sunday. Rochester, who is floundering, uh, really needs a win bad uh, against Panther City, who plays everybody tough at home. And, uh, well, that's because the Do Not Disturb sign is up on the wall. And, uh, there's no one there to disturb play tennis. <laughs> Shh, they're serving. <laughs> Never understood that, man. You know, golf or tennis. Golf or maybe the cousin or tennis. You know, yeah. you know shh, don't say a word. Shh. Baseball, you know, 100-mile-an-hour fastball coming at you that's doing this all over the place, and you have 50,000 people screaming their lungs out. No problem. No. Tennis, one person sneezes. Whoa, whoa. Oh, oh. Oh, so, man, the city's very good and the quiet. They work out very well there. You, you might, might hear the cattle uh, mooing from the livestock show that they <laughs> you have actually might, Yeah, you might actually hear the yeah. gunshot next door, the, the, the yeah. firing up around. And... Yosemite Sam. <laughs> uh, let's just hope that they're able to clean up from the rodeo the day before that uh, yeah. everything's off the turf <laughs> anyways we, we jostle them but uh, it really is a beautiful arena it is 
I really wish that other people in uh, Fort Worth would understand how beautiful it is to come in there. I hear they have air conditioning. <laughs> Warm there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that is the week that was. Any final comments? Oh, thank you very much, Brian. Good luck in uh, good luck with Calgary next week. <laughs> Mike, I'll start with you. Any final comments for the week? Uh, just uh, another big slate of games next week. And, you know, we talked before this week started that, that I think there were 68 games left or something like that, half the season. And we're going to get through a quarter of those games just between this weekend and next weekend. So, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we're we're already, so, we're already yeah, starting back. to see yeah. movement, you know, teams that, you know, Las Vegas is, is, inching closer to a playoff spot. New York just fell out of a playoff spot. Suddenly Calgary's in a playoff spot. Buffalo looks like they might be teetering towards not having a playoff spot. Right. So. All right, Sean, any last words? Yeah, I was actually going to say, I'm interesting, interested to see how this Buffalo kind of storyline plays out. Because if uh, Vince is out long term, yeah, we could see a Buffalo team that's out of the playoffs. Isn't that wonderful? I eh? haven't seen that in years. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen that in years. But, uh, you know, I think it's possible. There's a lot of talent on that team, though. I wouldn't write them off just yet. No, oh, no. Absolutely oh, no, no. I want to remind everybody, I want to thank everybody for being with us uh, week in and week out. We just hit uh, over 3,400 uh, follows on our uh, Facebook page. I want to thank everybody for that. Um, our, fa our YouTube one, I'm really pushing towards getting more there because we have a lot more coming up there. I was just looking at the uh, the games that are going to go up, and uh, one of them is the 1990 Mill Championship. A um, couple of games there are from uh, 2002 and 2001. One is Toronto and New York, and one is the Vancouver Ravens against the Buffalo Bandits. So they're going to be going up in the next little while as well. There's the Toronto-Rochester game going up in the next day or so uh, from 1999 over in Maple Leaf Gardens. So another historic barn is not around anymore so yeah give us a give us a check on youtube give us a subscribe please and uh, tell your friends and family about that one as well remember we always have our fingers on the pulse of the situation we were all over the new york move we were all over a number of things this week and uh, we are up to date with everything we spend a great time um, covering and watching um, all the games from all over the place and uh, we are up to date with all of our Figures, our stats, and everything else. So we appreciate your patronage, and we love you to come back week in and week out. Remember next week, because of my uh, my traveling schedule and uh, being in from San Diego, that we are going to be 10 p.m. Eastern time uh, for our show next Sunday night. Uh, and then we're back to our regular nines until the end of April. And then uh, I'm traveling to Prague, and then we have to, we'll be working on that one too. So <laughs> there's always something on the go. I want to thank everybody for being with us. Uh, me personally, I am looking forward to uh, seeing how the West Coast is looking and uh, to see this Pachanga Arena in person. I've never been there. So I'm looking forward to, to having a great old time over there. And until next week, for Muffler Mike and for Sean Slott, I'm Gary Groove. Wishing you the best of weeks. Keep your stick in your hand. And we will see you all again next week at 10 p.m. Eastern. Till then. Thank you.